Hi, I'm Jane Rudolph. And I'm Monsignor Charles Meinong. I'm Father Joe Glass. Welcome to Real to Real. Joe, I think we have a very special announcement. We sure do. Who's going we're, to make it? I'd love to. I, I would we're like to. We're very happy to wish Jane much happiness. She has promised now to marry. And with Jane, best wishes to you. Thank you, Monsignor. Congratulations Thank to you, Father. Jane. You're going to show us your ring? Sure. Congratulations Can to you Sean see it? as well. <laughs> uh, so we're also happy for you, Jane. Thank you yeah. very much. Yes, this time next year, I guess I'll be changing my last name. And I'm sure we'll be hearing a lot more about this as it gets closer. I think so. I think so. You'll probably be tired of it by the end of this year. <laughs> no, no, it's exciting. It's <laughs> you exciting. won't be tired about tonight's show, though, because this evening we're going to give you an opportunity to learn how people are using their hands to promote world peace. Joe Swope has some interesting things for us about this year's television programming, and Father Francis Mean will introduce us to the idea of how faith and prejudice do work together. And watch out if you're bumping into some strangers on the sidewalk this weekend. There's about 400 church personnel administrators in the city of Philadelphia. We'll be hearing about their 17th convocation from Father Donald Tim. The church is going to be evident, of course, during this upcoming convention. It's also evident when you talk about moral issues. But there's one evident of the church that might be unusual to most of us. Because when it comes to the United Nations, the church is there too. The church is really there. The church is in the world. It always annoys me when people say, what does the church say? The church does and says many, many things. You know, in all the tensions and problems in the world, no one is there more beautifully than the church trying to make the great Isaiah prophecy of the peaceable kingdom come to life. War. The nuclear arms race. Starvation. Famine. Prejudice. Hatred. These are only a few of the problems facing mankind, problems we must learn to solve in a mutual spirit of peace, brotherhood, and cooperation, the kind of spirit that exists at the United Nations in New York City. Here, representatives of countries from around the globe meet to discuss the issues that affect their peaceful coexistence on Earth. Chartered in 1945 with 51 members, the United Nations today includes 159 nations. In these chambers sit the powerful and the weak, the large and the small, the lion and the lamb, all working together to hopefully make a difference in the state of the world. Sitting among this gathering of nations, normally off to one side or the other, is a representative of Pope John Paul II. The Holy See maintains a seat in the General Assembly of the United Nations, not as a voting member, but as an observer, carefully watching, listening, and sometimes commenting on the issues being discussed. The work being done here is of interest to the Vatican because the goals of the United Nations and the Catholic Church are one in the same. Promoting peace. Archbishop Renato Raphael Martino heads the body of Vatican observers, formerly known as the Permanent Observer Mission of the Holy See to the United Nations. What we do here, as I, I told you, we are observer. Uh, uh, we have observer stat status, and so we, we watch what is happening and uh, uh, report to the to the to the Pope is uh, very important because here is the uh, an international arena where uh, uh, you can listen to uh, all the nations of the of the world. Practically, there are 159 members uh, to. Uh, United Nations, uh, uh, and so the Holy See uh, has uh, diplomatic relations with uh, 115. At United Nations, uh, all the problems of the of the world come to for discussions, for uh, solution. We watch that, and uh, we we try also uh, in what we can do to to help to find the solutions. What we offer. It's our 
experience, the experience of the, of the church in humanity. Observing the United Nations is an awesome task, for the bulk of the work is done in a number of smaller committee meetings. Here, different nations gather to formulate plans that will later be voted upon in the General Assembly. The Permanent Observer Mission maintains a staff of full-time attachés and volunteers who attend the meetings to observe. Father John Muthig is a priest of the Trenton Diocese, currently on loan to the mission. I think, Vince, there are two or three main goals that we have. The first would be to watch. An observer mission watches. And uh, the second is to report back what we see to the Holy Father through the Secretariat of State in Rome. The last thing we try to do, and it's just as important as the others, is to represent the teaching of the Church and of the Holy Father to the people working in the United Nations, both in the diplomatic community and in the UN agencies. There are three or four of us here on the full-time staff at the mission, and we try to coordinate uh, the work of, the, of uh, observing the entire UN. Uh, we have about 15 or 20 advisors, volunteers, men, women, religious, priests, um, who are experts in their own right in a particular field. And they will follow, for example, they will follow development issues, or they will follow human rights issues for us, or they will follow the questions of migrants or refugees. And they will report to us what's going on in their particular committee. We'll uh, edit their reports and, and send them out. We ourselves also follow certain committees. Uh, I try to keep my hand in on the committee that's looking at the questions of information, and news gathering around the world, and also uh, certain human rights issues. Unglamorous as it may seem, most of the work is reading, translating, reporting, documenting, and writing. Father Muthig is more reporter than international ambassador, even though his job requires him to be both. I think what we're trying to do is to be ambassadors, first ambassadors of Christ, which doesn't allow for a lot of compromise, although it allows for a lot of dialogue, and the secondly, to be ambassadors of the Holy Father. Uh, we know where he stands. And, um, and we want to use every opportunity we can to, to say where he stands on issues and to express that as kindly, as conciliatorily, as uh, diplomatically as we can, but to say it straight out. Uh, I think that's an important part of our work. We try to be selective. We try to really accent those um, issues that, that relate to human and Christian and moral values. Um, of course, many do. Disarmament certainly does. There's a great relationship between disarmament and, uh, and, and where we stand as people, as human beings. Uh, our race is threatened. Uh, so, there, you know, there are clear moral questions there. There are development questions. Uh, if we're spending money on arms, that's money that could have been spent somewhere else to solve uh, the great peace and justice issues of our world. Racism, apartheid, you name it, uh, we're concerned about it. Do we affect 159 member nations? I would say yes, at least minimally. You know, uh, just the fact that at least some of us are walking around in distinctive garb, whether it's a, a clerical shirt or a collar, sitting behind uh, a marker that says Holy See, uh, people are aware that the church is there. But at the same time, we, we want to put our, our uh, we want to shoot with, the, with our full guns, you know, that this is where the church stands. And um, if there's a compromise to be worked out, okay. But what we want to represent is the, uh, the true teaching of Christ and of the church and of Christ's vicar, the Pope. Indeed, as in our marriage, in our homes, in our work, the church is there. So in the extra extraordinary exploitations of the United Nations, so the church is there, and thank God. And you're here tonight to so stay with us because Father Joe Glass is up next. Since 1981, Real to Real has been proclaiming the good news by bringing you stories of Christian faith in action. We do it by roaming the Delaware Valley, searching for people of faith, hope, and charity. But like all modern media, it is an expensive proposition. If you're a new viewer, or if you've enjoyed Real to Real for many years, we'd like to thank you for watching and invite you to participate by actively supporting the show. With costs rising all around us, we need your financial support. A donation of five, ten, twenty dollars, or whatever you can send will help to keep us on the air. Send your contributions to Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, PA, 19103. And thank you.
church has been around for almost 2,000 years, and for the last 18 years of that church existence, there has been an association known as NACPA, the National Association of Church Personnel Administrators. Doesn't trip so lightly off the tongue, a little complicated to pronounce, and complicated in their many services that NACPA offers to the church. With us to explain NACPA and what they do in terms of their ministry to church workers and church employer, uh, is Father Donald Tim from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He's in Philadelphia for the 17th Annual Convocation of Church Personnel Administrators. Don, welcome to Real to Real. Pleasure to be here. NACPA is fairly new on the timeline of church. What is the Association of Church Personnel Administrators and how did it come into existence? What has created a need for this in the church? Good, thank you. Uh, so 18 years ago at a National Federation of Priest Council meeting there, uh, grew the need that we needed to become better at being an employer. And the reality was that many people were asked to serve client groups like priests and sisters, but were never trained for it. And so out of that experience grew this uh, new organization called NACPA. And at that point, someone had the vision to realize that it's not just priests and clergy who serve the church, but also lay people. And so therefore, the name was not for priests or for religious, but personnel administrators. And since that time, uh, we have grown from a small organization to about a thousand members across the United States and a few from Canada. And our goal is to um, promote just treatment of those who serve the church, whether they be clergy, religious, or lay. And, and that really is our agenda, that we do everything we can to give people the skills and the tools, and where possible and necessary to advocate for that just treatment of people. Now, when you mentioned you have about a thousand members, are all the members priests? Uh, who, who makes up uh, the NACPA? The membership is, is really well divided amongst priests, religious, and lay. I think we're about 50, 50, or 60, 40, a um, few more women than we have men. And the growing new membership into our organization um, are those who um, serve um, like diocesan central or congregational um, central, central offices where there are lay people. There are those people who are charged with serving that client group or people who serve in parishes. Many parishes, um, pastors are joining from parishes if they have larger staffs or some parishes have lay business managers who have the responsibility for um, parish employees. And so they're also coming to join us and, and get assistance. Okay, now by joining or by uh, getting in contact with you or representatives of NACPA, what kind of services are available to the local church and to dioceses around the country? Uh, we initially began by providing regional workshops um, to whatever group, whether they be priests or religious congregation. And we continue to do regional workshops, today often by invitation. Uh, we also produce a whole variety of resources, manuals are one of them. Some of our recent ones have been on compensation, retirement issues, performance review planning, um, how do you set up parish or diocesan personnel policy. So we have a whole host of manuals. And um, we also do something called an audit, which a parish or a diocese or a congregation could call us and say, we'd like you to look at how we're serving priests or how we're serving the employees in the central office. Tell us what's going well and tell us where we could improve. And so we have people trained who can do this audit. But the agenda, the, what, what we're really committed to is promoting this just treatment. It's in response to the bishop's economic pastor that we can't ask other people in society to do what we first do not do. And that's also been a tradition through other bishops' um, uh, documents about we need to act justly institutionally and individually. And so that's what the main thrust of NACPA is to make sure that our own house is in order right. while we uh, continue to in instruct and lead those outside organizations, right. uh, that we want to be not only a prime teacher, but a prime example of how to be a good employer. What Absolutely. Are you, what are you finding? Uh, what are the trends now? You, you mentioned that once this started, uh, naturally out of a federation of priest meeting, we're finding we do employ a great number of lay people, and I imagine that is increasing. Uh, obviously, we think of Catholic schools and the teachers, but mm -hmm. also today there seems to be fewer and fewer priests, sisters, mm -hmm. and religious to serve in parish communities. Uh, how is this growing number of laity being employed by the church affecting your work? Well, it's, it's affecting it significantly in that um, in the last 25 years, the central offices of the diocese, for instance, themselves employ so many more people because people expect and want more services out of the church uh, as in a parish. And um, what we're finding is that very often in the past, people are coming in to serve who now have expectations of being treated in a very consistent formal way where there are policies that ensure that people are treated fairly, that there may be some ongoing feedback for performance review, that there's a fair and compensation system. Um, so we're finding that we need to be much more sophisticated at what we do. We need to be much more professional at what we do because we're really asked to be good managers, good stewards of the people that, that serve the church. And we're talking about people now coming to work for the church and, and uh, exercising their, their baptismal rights who, who need to make a salary 
in order to support their family, their wives. This isn't all the uh, celibate uh, people right. working for the church anymore. How will this affect the average person in the, in the pew, some of these trends in the future? Well, I think some of the trends is we uh, focus for more just treatment, which includes just wage, which is not the only. It could mean a couple of things. It could mean as Catholics we may need to um, share more of our financial wealth with the church so that the people who work can indeed have a living or support their congregation members. Um, it could also mean that if we're to do what we do justly, that maybe we're not going to be able to have as much as we used to. Um, uh, not everyone would work for the church without a fair wage, and yet we expect some people to, to work for less than what is fair and just. And so I think the tension will be can, how long can we continue to do things that are good, but at the expense of someone being treated justly, or um, as Catholics, are we going to learn how to support and share more of the wealth we've been given? Absolutely, and, and make all of those jobs in the church appear to be attractive. We want to attract people to oh, yeah. work for the church, and they need to see us as a just employer. Absolutely. Well, Father, I thank you for being here, and I congratulate you. I forgot to mention, you have just been recently elected president of NACPA, so we, he uh, stepped up this weekend at the convocation yes, from president-elect to president. Thanks for being here. Best of luck in your term with the presidency. Back to you now, Monsignor and Jane. What a wonderful opportunity to see the great value of the church and the broad perspectives of hunger and peace and the need for peace, and then to see the value of the church has to work at impersonal and the narrow subjects of our own parish and dioceses. We sometimes miss the inherent value of justice and openness, which is there. Openness to not only race and creed and color, but of course religion. And tonight, Father Francis Meehan comes to us in viewpoint and gives us a chance to reflect on the question, are we truly open in our openness to religion? Today I thought we'd take up a question that's a very important one for our times. It's that question about religion and prejudice. The question is, does our religion make us more prejudiced or less prejudiced? Does our religion open us up to others or does it close us? You know, oftentimes when this question is spoken about, people just seem to assume sometimes that it's the religious person who's the one who's narrow or who is closed or biased. But amazingly, in the past few years, some very significant studies have shown just the opposite, that the person who really is into their faith, who really is practicing, is a person who tends to be most open to other ethnic groups, to other races, to even to other religions. I often think of that wonderful place in the New Testament in John's Gospel where Jesus is walking along and he comes to a well. And he says to the woman, give me to drink. And she says, you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan and a woman, to drink? In other words, Jesus is portrayed as the one who breaks down the barriers because it was the Samaritans who were supposed to be his enemy. But the one, Jesus, who worships the Father in truth and spirit begins to break down those things from between peoples. So, in other words, a deeper faith the faith in the Jesus who, who's really the Son of the Father, who worships the Father, as he said, in spirit and truth, is a faith that breaks down barriers rather than erects barriers. Do you know, after the Second World War, there were some very important studies done by a famous psychologist. They were called the Allport Studies after the psychologist Gordon Allport. And he found a strange thing. He found there were two basic types of religious people. One he called the internal type. And they were people really devoted. We would call them devout. They read the scriptures, they prayed, and he found that they tended to be less prejudiced. Whereas, he said, those who treat religion more as a membership, more as a kind of thing that shores up their own identity of belonging and their own insecurity, he says, they tend to be less open to other peoples, more prejudiced. Allport studies in a sense, are almost surprising. They have that paradox. The religious person who's most deeply religious is more open to the other, to the outsider. So the great question of our day, the great challenge, is my faith, is our faith opening us up to others? If it is, we're really worshiping the God in spirit and truth, the God of Jesus, who could ask a Samaritan woman for a drink. Father Meehan's viewpoint has such strong ties to the first story we had this evening when we said that the United Nations and the Church had a common ground, a common goal, and that was, of course, world peace. And we'll continue that common goal and common ground with you in just another moment. <laughs> Honey, don't tell him that. Get off the phone.
phone. Mom. Now, I gotta go. Bye. You are invited to St. Charles Seminary in Overbrook on Friday evening, November 18th, to witness a truly unique performance by Mr. Tony Melendez. It is like no other day before you and I will never be the same. Come share in this inspirational performance of Love and Faith with Tony Melendez, 7.30 p.m. Friday, November 18th at St. Charles Seminary. For tickets and information, phone 587-3571. comments and suggestions and encourage you to write to us at Real to Real, 222 North 17th Street, room 907, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19103, or call us during regular business hours at 215-668-9842. Oh, September is such a nice month with new beginnings, new school shoes, everybody getting off of the lazy summertime and getting back to work, and usually the new fall season of television shows. Only this year, Monsignor, it was more like the new winter season of television shows. Well, now that new winter has set in, we have to look out for our nestling into home, and that makes us more accommodating to each other. And that means our home entertainment has to be looked at. Joe Swope is coming up. Perhaps Joe Swope can help us how to select good home entertainment on television. Joe? Thank you, Monsignor. The fall television season was long delayed by the Hollywood writer's strike, but now, finally, after a few fall starts, it seems to be into high gear. It takes a lot for me to turn on my television, and it takes even more for me to stick to the network programming, especially with cable's multitude of possibilities. But I did manage to tune in to some of the early premieres of the new network series though I must admit I wasn't terribly impressed. NBC apparently believes that the key to success this year is the casting of a well-known TV actor in the role of a suddenly single bachelor. That's the premise of not one, but two situation comedies, Dear John and Empty Nest. Dear John stars ex-taxi star Judd Hirsch as a school teacher whose wife runs off with his best friend. Most of the series takes place in an encounter group for the recently divorced. Well, actually, she left me, Kirk. She left me for a man that I considered to be my best friend. Why? Well, we used to go to basketball games together and hang out and have a few beers. <laughs> Empty Nest stars soap star Richard Mulligan as a widowed surgeon with two adult daughters. Both of these shows are funny in spots and show some promise, but when the biggest laugh is gotten by Richard Mulligan's dog, you know that the sporting cast still needs some work. The whole time we were growing up, she was that way. What way? Perky. Happy. <laughs> it's disgusting. I mean, where's a little despair, a little depression, for God's sake? Read some Dostoevsky. Please. <laughs> Please, if she is happy, leave her alone. I am just trying to inject a little reality into her life, Daddy. Oh, don't talk to me about reality. I ABC is already touting Roseanne as the funniest new comedy on television. Well, it is funny, but where's the acting? Roseanne Barr stars as a factory worker who must contend with an unemployed husband and three rambunctious kids. But as an actress, Roseanne is still a pretty good stand-up comedian. You know it'd be really good for breakfast? What? Hi. Tell him no. No. <laughs> CBS is a little laid out of the blocks, but is pinning much of their hopes on two new shows by TV legends Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore. However, both of these shows have faced nightmarish pre-production problems and have undergone major conceptual changes. That usually does not bode well. CBS is also unveiling a new series based on the hit film Dirty Dancing. Well, I suppose someone should be excited about that. All in all, none of these shows are terrible, but none of them glue me to my seat. If I had to rush home to turn on one of these programs, I probably wouldn't. Maybe he has to rush home for something else. Maybe if it's not TV, he should find something to do to rush home for. Maybe. What about <laughs> world peace? That certainly is something we should all rush home for. But I don't think you can do much about it when you're home watching television. However, there are a group of people who have found one way to sit quietly and promote world peace. And if you're wondering how they do it, well, it begins with the Apostles' Creed and ends with Hail, Holy Queen.
The basic idea of the whole thing was peace. We feel if we get more people around the world praying for peace, why someday we will actually have that. Our Lady's Rosary Makers is a nonprofit organization located in Louisville, Kentucky. It was the idea of a humble Zavarian brother. Brother Sylvan could take a piece of wire, some broken rosaries, and a pair of pointed pliers and come up with a strong handmade rosary. In 1949, he began teaching people to make rosaries for the missions. This pastime has become an international movement involving groups from all 50 states and at least 15 other countries. Today, Tom Young is president of Our Lady's Rosary Makers. People, I think, want to get involved, and they want to get involved in something that will do some good in the world. That you won't have to have diplomats or anybody to take care of things. We just get the people to pray in and love each other. And Pretty soon, why, the, the peace will come. Currently, there are over 15,000 members of the society, each handcrafting individual rosaries and sending them free of charge to various missions. Some rosary makers form groups that work under the spiritual guidance of a local religious leader. It is still small, the company has grown considerably since Brother Sylvan made his first mission rosaries. Every year, a handful of dedicated employees packages and ships over one million sets of beads, wire, and crucifixes to society members. So that's what it's all about. We want prayer. Prayer to God that we do get peace someday. Well, next week we're going to be talking not about sacrificial lands, but about sacrificial giving, tithing to the church. Tom Legere will tell us something very special about real presence. And Ayala will be with us giving us some tips on helping the hungry this holiday season. So, until next week, please take care. <laughs> Goodbye, and God bless you. Good night. We'll see you next week on Real to Real. Trick, trick, trick or, or treat. treat. <laughs>